Well, as we said, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We come to you, O Lord, our great shelter, our refuge, our fortress, the one who protects us and delivers us from the deadly fears of our own hearts and from the folly of our own hearts and lives. You rescue us by the great faithfulness which will always and forever be our shield and our buckler. And we praise you, O Lord, God of heaven, God most high. We rejoice in your promise that because we have made you, the Lord, our dwelling place, no evil shall be allowed to befall us, no plague that can damage us or destroy us forever shall come near to us because you have commanded your angels to guard us in all of our ways, to bear us up, to keep us from hurt, a dreaded hurt of the one who, like a lion, roars around seeking whom he may devour, the dreaded tempter, that ancient serpent himself. We shall tread him down. He shall be crushed beneath us by the God of peace himself because of the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have received the victory. And so, Lord, although we come before you this morning knowing our sinfulness, grieved by our weakness, by our faithlessness. We come before you as those who know that they have your promise. And so we know that we have your peace surrounding us now and always. You will answer us when we call because you have promised to do so. You will be with us to rescue us in trouble. You will satisfy us with your great salvation. And so we pray, O oh God, our Father, help us to live in the light of this wonderful truth. Help us to live so as to honor you and to bring glory to your name as we trust in your promise to us in Christ. And may all that we do this morning, the thoughts of our hearts, the words of our mouths, the response of our lives in the days to come, may all bring glory to our great Savior, Jesus Christ. For we ask all of these things in his name alone, and we trust in him alone, and we seek to do so for the glory of of God alone. And we ask, for Jesus' sake, amen. Well, let me welcome you very warmly to our uh, service this morning, whether you're up here and I can see you or whether you're downstairs, and I hope that you can see and hear us uh, properly. We uh, are delighted this morning to welcome as our guest preacher, Dr. Richard Pratt, who joins us from uh, Florida where he is the uh, head of Third Millennium Ministries. Richard has been with us this past week teaching our pastor's training course and uh, will be with us this coming week when he's speaking at our Expositors Conference, Servants of the Word. And Richard, it's a delight to welcome you back to our fellowship here uh, at the Tron. If you have one of these sheets here on your, uh, on your seats, you can see the notices for this week. I won't go through them all, but you will see in the middle there that on Wednesday evening, we have a meeting here of the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership. We'll be joined by folks we trust from various other congregations in the city and beyond in the West of Scotland. And Richard is to be our guest speaker, speaking on the subject of leadership for the next millennium. Yesterday morning, we had a breakfast of church leaders at Harper Church, and Richard was beginning to speak on that, and we very, very much look forward to that. So do come along on Wednesday evening, bring your friends and it promises to be an evening of great encouragement. You'll see on the right-hand side numbers of notices there, 
and uh, I just draw them to your attention. Very special welcome to Kara Murray. It's lovely to see you, Kara, all the way from Thailand, and we're delighted that you're here with us during this month, and I hope that uh, you really enjoy your time with us here. You've been much in our prayers with your family, as always, and it's great to see you sitting next to your Uncle Roy there. We're delighted to see you. We're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning, and uh, if you have one of our church Bibles, uh, you'll find it in the New Testament, in Matthew's Gospel, at chapter 6. Somebody shout out the page number from the church Bible, and then I'll tell you, because my Bible is different. Sorry? 811. Page 811 in our church Bibles. Beginning of the New Testament, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 6. And Richard is going to be focusing on that portion that we know to be called, or we call anyway, the Lord's Prayer. But I'm going to read from Matthew 6, verse 1 through to verse 14. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles, the pagans do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You then pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Amen. May God bless to us this, His Word. And we're going to sing again hymn number 548, a hymn that reminds us how sure the Scriptures are, God's vital, urgent Word, as true as steel and far more sharp than any sword. Number 548.
Well, as we have a few moments of quiet now and the musicians play, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. You might like to read again these verses of the Lord's Prayer that we'll be studying shortly. As we do that, in the quiet, our offerings will be received. Now, this morning, I want to um, interview uh, our friends Simon and Joanna McClure. Let me give you that to, to you, Simon. Simon and Joanna, uh, as you know, joined our church uh, last year, and they've been with us uh, over this last year or so. But I want to introduce them to you uh, formally this morning and to pray for them, to commission them for the ministry that has brought them to Glasgow. But let me just first uh, ask you, Simon, tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you, uh, where are you both from? And uh, tell us a little of your, your story. Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, welcoming us here in the church. And it's been fantastic to be here for the last year or so. Uh, I'm originally from St. Albans. Uh, I grew up there. Uh, Andy Gemmel uh, and uh, Annie uh, were in the church uh, there at Spicer Street, St. Albans. Uh, this is where we met. And uh, uh, yeah, so... so uh, Joanna, you, you're not from St. Albans. No. <laughs> Where are you from? I was born in Hong Kong, and then the whole family immigrated to UK in 1984. Okay. And so you met Simon in St. Albans. And then for the last number of years before you've come to Glasgow here, you've been living elsewhere. Tell us where you've been and what you've been doing. So for the last 10 years, we were working in Southeast Asia, and I was doing counseling, and Simon was teaching in the university. And Simon, um, what came about to uh, cause you to come to Glasgow from where you were working in Asia? Okay, so that's quite a long story. Um, make it short. Make it short. <laughs> I mean, we were very aware that uh, Glasgow has such wonderful weather. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the air here is very, very clean. And... And um, uh, also, uh, we knew that there were many, many students here, uh, those studying in about six universities. And uh, we've worked, as, as we said, in Asia for the last 10 years. And we have discovered that many uh, are coming now to Glasgow to do further study. And so we knew that this was a very strategic city. And we looked at a number of cities. And uh, Willie convinced us that uh, Glasgow was the best place for us. Um, uh, but also... Also, uh, we're aware that um, 
Uh, you could go to any city in the UK and work with thousands of international students. We, we, we knew that. Uh, but we're also aware very much of the Lord's leading. Uh, there were uh, a number of uh, very important uh, people who encouraged us to come here. My parents were very supportive. I have a brother and uh, his family in, in Edinburgh, or uh, sorry, Edinburgh. And, uh, and they were very happy that we came here. My parents were happy too. And, uh, and so, so this is the place that we, uh, we ended up. And uh, we're, we're, very, we're very happy to, to be here. Uh, also, um, I once did a mission trip in, in, in a, uh, an Indian island, um, an Indian Ocean island. And uh, uh, Fiona McDougall's late husband, Ian, was my next door neighbor. And, and he was the first person who introduced me to uh, Glaswegian and, and Glaswegian-ness. And so, and so that was a huge blessing and, and possibly the Lord's leading uh, uh, for us to, 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 to be coming here. And you're going to be working here, Joanna, with uh, uh, students uh, together and uh, helping to encourage them and train them. What, what can we pray particularly for the, for the both of you as you start with this, uh, with this new ministry? Um, as a wife and a mother, I uh, would like all of you continue to pray for me, continue to be a loving and supportive wife and mother, as well as working with what God wants us to do in Glasgow. We're working with returnees, so we hope to train them going back to their country to be the light and the salt for the country. Okay. Simon, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think we're very aware that uh, international students who come to the UK and uh, maybe they, come, they become Christians here and they go back uh, into their home environments, we're very aware that that transition is a very, very difficult one. Uh, they may have come to faith in an English-speaking church, uh, and most Western churches are actually very, very easygoing. They're very laid back, they're encouraging, they're friendly, and so forth. Uh, and going back into a Chinese context... Is, is very different. Uh, one of the issues is that some of the churches are enormous. You may have a church with two or 3,000 people and nobody seems to really know each other. Or, or you may go back into a smaller house church fellowship where everybody knows each other and maybe everybody knows too much about each other and, and all of the challenges that go along with that. And, and often the Chinese church is very highly driven uh, they're driven to uh, evangelism and discipleship and programs of this and that and everything else. And, and sometimes it is exhausting for somebody to go back into that environment. Uh, Chinese culture is often a very, very much a doing culture. And so one of, one of our visions is to be able to introduce uh, people to the gospel here, uh, to encourage them, to, to build friendships with them, uh, to equip them to go back and to be effective in their home environment for the gospel within the local church. We want to see them uh, uh, empowered with a vision for church and for building up the church. Uh, we want to see them studying the Bible in their, in their heart language. Uh, we want to see them praying with other believers. Uh, we want to see them uh, working side by side in, in, uh, as co-workers in the gospel uh, because we believe that the gospel is, is good. It, it, it's something that God has, has given to us, and it's amazing. And so uh, we believe that the gospel saves. And, and so do pray that we would continue to be gospel-focused, gospel-centered, uh, that we would be thrilled with the cross and the resurrection every day, and that we would not stop, we would not cease uh, to share that and to communicate that effectively with, with those that we work with. Well, let's pray for you now as we uh, stand. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful partnerships in the gospel that do indeed span this whole world. We thank you for the way that Simon and Joanna have been used in countries far away from here with people uh, who need to know your gospel and who love your Son and who are seeking to build a church in Southeast Asia. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have put it into their hearts to come here to our city to minister among those who are finding Christ here and then are seeking to return to their own lands and be a part of his church, to be missionaries for him, to be proclaimers of his name. 
We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that already we have shared with them as part of our church here. And we thank you that they are with us working for the same glory of the same Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would bless and prosper their work here in Glasgow, work associated with our own congregation here and also with various others in this city, and much in their own home and in the homes and workplaces of others. We pray that you would give them a continuing love and desire to help and to bless your people from far lands who are studying here and with whom we have so many opportunities during their time here. We ask, Lord, for Joanna, that you will help her to be a loving and a faithful mother, to encourage the family, and to help Simon in all the work that he is doing. We pray that you would be with both of them to kindle the fire of your love in their hearts daily, that as they seek to bring the good news of our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, into the lives and the hearts of many, that you would bless that work, that you would water and nourish the seeds sown and planted by them, and that in the months and in the years to come, back in Asia as well as here in Glasgow, there might be much fruit from their labors. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful bonds that we share with so many around the world, and especially in Southeast Asia, with which we have been connected in so many countries for so many years through this church fellowship here. We pray for the many others who are working there even now. We rejoice in seeing Kara here that reminds us of her mum and dad working there at the River Kwai Hospital in Thailand. We thank you for others dear to our hearts, and we rejoice, Lord, that this same gospel which we have believed and trusted in is even now bearing fruit all over this world for the glory of Christ. And so, Lord, would you fill our hearts with this joy and fill us with the vision and the scope of your glorious kingdom that our eyes might be lifted up to see the wonder of what you are doing and the privilege of what you have called us, every one of us, to be a part of. So, Lord, bless Simon and Joanna and their family. Bless their home life. Bless their work. Bless their ministry for the Lord Jesus. And bless their fellowship with us here and with many other believers in Glasgow. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, do uh, ask Simon and Joanna all more about their work, and uh, do let's be encouraged together as we pray for them and we partner with them here in Glasgow. Today is a great day of commissioning. Uh, this evening, we have uh, an ordination service for uh, Rupert Hunt Taylor. Rupert is going to be uh, ordained here this evening. We've got a group of uh, other ministers coming to lay hands upon him. It'll be a significant service. Uh, both for Rupert and also for our own congregation here, but also for those others who he has been training with and who are recognizing his ministry and for gospel partnership here in Glasgow. So do come along this evening. Uh, we look forward to uh, Richard uh, preaching again and also to Dick Lucas, who is here with us for the conference this week and is going to be giving a charge to uh, Rupert and the congregation. So this evening promises to be uh, an important and an encouraging time together. But uh, as I said, Richard Pratt is going to be speaking to us now this morning, and before he comes to preach God's Word to us, let's sing once again a hymn which is a prayer, number 534, on this assembled host in this accepted hour, O Spirit, as at Pentecost, descend in all your power. We meet with one accord in our appointed place and wait the promise of our Lord, the Spirit of all grace. Number 534.
Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be with you. If you were not here about a year and a half ago when I was here, um, I'm here now for the first time for you. But for those of you who are back here for the second time when I'm here, thank you very much. I always assume it's just sort of the luck of the draw if you are invited to a church the first time. But the second time, they probably liked you a little bit, so thank you very much. But the third time will be a sure thing, so I'm waiting for that. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, God bless you all. Now, we're going to be looking at a part of the Bible that we often call the Lord's Prayer, and I'll speak slowly at first so you can get used to my accent. Many of you will know this prayer. Maybe you don't know it as the Lord's Prayer, but as our Father. And that is our concern this morning, but let me introduce what we're going to say today in this way. I think we all know that in one way or another, life is a series of ups and downs, good times and bad times. And as you go through life, you learn that more and more. As much as you wish that things could just go along steady like this, I think we all understand that if you go to a hospital room and you see someone and the monitor above them is doing this, that's not a good sign. In fact, you wanted to go up and down on that monitor, don't you? And in many ways, that's just the way life is as we experience it now in this world. Whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, life goes up, life goes down. And when the good times, I mean the really good times, or the very hard times come, we usually don't have much question about where we should give our attention. We're going to give it to the celebration of these great times, or we're going to give it to dealing with the problem that we're facing. There's usually not much problem with that. I mean, think of it this way. When you have a newborn child, your first child, your whole life is consumed by the fact that you have a new child. And when someone dear that you love very much passes away, your life at that time is consumed by that tragedy. Or when you're first married, life is good. You're so excited you can't stand it. Your whole life revolves around the fact that you're married. And unfortunately, in our day when families fall apart, your life is consumed with that as well. That happens also in churches, you know, local churches, even like yours, where we go through up times and we go through down times. And in those high points, we're there with it. When we're at the low points, we're there with it. But the thing I want us to ask about this morning is, what do we do? What do we think about? What should be our priorities when we're not at the top or at the bottom, but when life is returning to something of a norm? You know, the boring times of life. What should be our priority? What should be our dream? What should be our hope at a time like that? Because those come to your life too. And in fact, even when you're up and you're down, that steady motion in the middle is that to which you return and find comfort and strength or find orientation and destiny and sense of belonging. It's just so very important for us to ask the question then, what do you do? What should be most important? What are the priorities when life is neither up nor down, but when it's just ordinary? And there are many places in the Bible where you could find an answer to that kind of question. Many places. But I'm convinced that one of the most succinct and special and even memorable parts of the Bible that tells us what should be our steady priority, our steady purpose, our steady goal, our steady dream is in this part of the Bible that we call the Lord's Prayer. The reason for this is fairly obvious. For when is it that you pray? I mean, even if you're not a believer... You discover yourself sometimes praying to God, don't you? And believers do the same thing. They discover that they're praying to God. But when does that actually happen? Except when things are going bad or when things are really, really good. And when something important is going on, that's when you pray. And so when Jesus is asked, Lord, teach us how to pray, he's not simply telling us how to pray. He's also telling us what was important to him and what should be important to every man woman and child who follows him. What are those priorities that we find in this thing called the Lord's Prayer? Now, as I've looked at Christians and as I've looked at my own life, 
I've discovered something. We do tend to find the priorities of ordinary life in this thing we call the Lord's Prayer, but usually it's in the bottom half of the Lord's Prayer. You know how it goes. Give us this day our daily bread, which means basically, Lord, please take care of me. I'm depending on you for this. Forgive us our debts, which basically means, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. I've done it again. I'm, I'm sorry for my sins. That's normal in the Christian life. And then lead us not into temptation, which basically means help me do better tomorrow than I did today, please. Now, if that's where you are, if that's the priority of your life, to depend more on God, to find forgiveness of your sins in Jesus, and to do better tomorrow than you did today, way to go. Fantastic. Because you're far ahead of most of the human race. Do you realize that most of the people who will be on the street today as you leave this church do not have even that much going for them? Not even that much sense of what's important. They tend to just bounce around from one thing to another, whatever happens to catch their fancy or whatever is driving them neurotically to some kind of compulsion. But followers of Jesus understand that he has given us the priorities. He's given us the goals of life. And they are in that bottom half of the Lord's Prayer. But this morning, I want to suggest something to you. There's a reason why those last petitions say, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, lead us not into temptation, and a reason why we're attracted to that part of the Lord's Prayer. It's because it's all about us. Imagine such a thing as that. You and me being attracted to things that are about you and me. But you know as well as I do, that's not the way the first half of the Lord's Prayer is. It's about someone else. You know, the part of the Lord's Prayer that you hurry through so you can get down to something that means something to you. Give us this day our daily bread. You know how it goes. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you see the difference in orientation? the priority, the important things that are put first in this thing called the Lord's Prayer. I'm convinced of this, that you and I normally live our lives down here doing things that are about you and me so much that we really do find ourselves challenged by what Jesus says in the opening of the Lord's Prayer. And in at least two different ways. Let me say first that I think The first thing that Jesus challenged both his disciples and you and me to do some adjusting on, some changing on, it has to be about what we believe, what we do, what we feel about God. About God himself. Our Father. Man, those are precious words to Christians. Maybe if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't realize just how precious that is to someone who loves Jesus. Because we believe this, and we know this to be true, that the one who made everything, I mean everything, can become your personal, intimate, caring father. It's an amazing thing when you think about that that he can know you by name, that he can care about you and your family by name, that he knows your problems, he knows what's coming, he knows what has gone. He can be your spiritual father. In fact, the Bible says, to as many as receive Jesus, to them he gives the right to become the children of God. So maybe if you're here and you've heard that Christians actually know God as their father, and you've never experienced that, it's not difficult. It's just one big step you have to take to know God as your Father. And it's simply this. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And he will make God your Father too. Unfortunately, though, when... Christian people, and even people that don't follow Jesus, when they hear God as our Father, 
very typically, our minds almost go immediately to an image of God, an imaginary image of God, that makes us think of God a little bit differently than what Jesus actually had in mind here. It's the image of God that comes to little children's minds, but then pops into our heads also, doesn't it? That God is like a sweet granddaddy. Long white beard, sitting up in heaven in his celestial rocking chair, rocking back and forth like this looking down on the earth, noticing all of his children down there, and wringing his hands like this and saying to himself, oh, I wish my children on the earth would just pay more attention to me and listen to what I have to say because I've done everything I can possibly do to take care of them and to make life good for them, and it would make me so much happier if they would just pay attention to me because, after all, I exist for them. Uh, That is what sweet granddaddies are like. I know I am one. I'm the sweetest grandfather there is in the whole world. And my grandchildren think that's true, too. I can guarantee it. But I can tell you this. I'm no fool. I know exactly why they feel that way about me. They love me so much, but I know why. It's because when they were little, every time I saw them, every single time, I'd hug them real big and I'd whisper in their ears, I love you so much. And then the next thing I would say to them is this. Do you want to go to the toy store now? And I'd take them there, and I'd buy them whatever they wanted. It didn't matter what they wanted. I can buy two. Let's have three of those. That will be great. Now, as they get older, of course, you have to stop that foolishness because their tastes become more expensive, don't they? But when they're young, you can buy two, three, four, five. Of it. It's no problem. Let's go for it. And that's why they love me. Yes, I'm a sweet granddaddy because I live for my grandchildren. But I have some good news for you. That's not what Jesus meant when he said, God is your father. We get the first clue of this by the fact that Jesus says, don't just pray our Father. He says, pray our Father in heaven. And when you look at the Bible, every time the Bible describes heaven, it's the same way. Heaven is the throne room of God. It's where God sits on a magnificent throne. A river of fire pours out from beneath his feet. A rainbow surrounds him. Lightning flashes. Thunder echoes through the halls of his palace. And around him are creatures that are crying out day and night, Holy, 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 hallowed be your name. You see, that's what Jesus had in mind. Our Father in heaven, holy, holy, holy be your name. He was reminding his disciples of the number one way that the Bible describes God to us. The number one way. And it's this. God is our king, seated on the throne over all of creation. Now, you might be surprised to know this, but in the days of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, both in Israel and outside of Israel, it was very common for people to call their human kings their fathers. It was a paternal image for a king. So when Jesus says, pray this way, this is what he's telling his disciples. Pray this way. Our royal father, enthroned in heaven, may your name be kept holy. You know, I come from a country where we don't have kings, or queens for that matter. And you know, if you've been around Americans for very long, you know that's in our blood. It's absolutely in our DNA, I'm convinced of it, that we will have no king. And in fact, in parts of the world where there are kings and queens, typically nowadays, they're a little more than symbolic. I mean, very few of us have ever lived in a place where a king holds our lives and our deaths in his hands. We don't want those kinds of kings around us. In America, we don't want any king at all, but even you don't want that kind of king. And why? Well, it's because they're terribly inconvenient to have around. You know why they're so inconvenient, those kinds of powerful kings? It's because, for some strange reason, kings think that their agenda is more important than yours. Imagine such a thing as that, huh? That their desires are more significant than your desires. In fact, they actually think that their citizens ought to live for their pleasure and for their glory. These kings actually think their citizens should be willing to die for them. Can you imagine anything more inconvenient than having a king like that ruling over your life? 
So in my country, we say no king whatsoever. In fact, I come from a state in the United States called Virginia. If you've ever been to the states, if you've ever been to Virginia, you know that all states in the United States have flags for each of their states. And I want to tell you about my flag of my home state because it describes not just Americans, it describes you too. You ready for this? It has this nice solid blue satin background and in the center of this circle, it's a picture. It's a picture of a man lying dead on his back. And next to him is a crown that's fallen off of his head. He's a dead king. And standing over this dead king, this is, can you believe this? Standing over this dead king is a woman. She has a spear in one hand and her foot on the chest of this dead king. And written around the edge of that circle are these words in Latin, sic semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. You got the message? We will not have a king in the state of Virginia. <laughs> and if somebody tries to become a king in the state of Virginia, we know exactly what to do. We send our women after them. <laughs> That's the message. We're not going to have a king who rules over us like that. I think that tells us something. The fact that even human kings are inconvenient to have around, I think that tells us something. If your religion, if your Christian faith has become convenient, and by that I mean you're never challenged anymore to change anything. You read the Bible and it fits like a hand in glove with who you find yourself to be. If you find that your faith has become convenient, then maybe, just maybe, you're yet to know what it means to say, God is your king. Don't you know he owns you? He gives you every breath you take. He gives you every morsel you eat. He gives you every good thing that is in your life. And for those of you who are in Christ, he bought you with the price of the blood of his own son. You no longer belong to yourself. You belong to him. And that's where the dream begins. That's where the mission is. That's where we go back, when life is being reoriented, when we're not in crisis, when things are going along, we must remember what Jesus says here, that our top priority in life must be that God is our King, our Royal Father, enthroned in heaven. May your name be kept holy. Let me live for that, Jesus. Day by day. As inconvenient as that may be, as difficult as it may be, it is why you breathe. Okay. I know I personally, and I suspect many of us here today, have some adjusting to do when it comes to recalculating, recalibrating what it means to say that God is our king. But Jesus also challenged his disciples and challenges you and me to do another kind of adjustment, a, a change in the way we think and the way we behave and the way we feel about another thing. It's going to sound strange, but let me say it. Jesus calls on us to change the way we think about the earth. Life on this planet, what we do day by day, as we breathe the air, as we go to work, as we deal with our children, as we deal with our spouses, as we deal with life as it is, life on this planet. And you know he does that because you know the words. Do you remember? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now what? Your kingdom come. You see, I told you he was thinking of God as king. Our Father, your kingdom come. Okay. Now, I grew up in a family where my grandmothers talked about the coming of the kingdom all the time. Now listen to this and see how she meant it. Every time we would go to her and say, Mama, can we have some more ice cream? Or Mama, can we have another piece of pie? She would look at us and say, Children, come over here. You can have all the ice cream you want. You can have another piece of pie. When the kingdom comes... 
So I learned as a very young child that what the kingdom coming meant was, no, never, get out of here, you're bothering me. Maybe when you die someday, you can have another piece of pie. How about that? So I knew it was a religious phrase I was supposed to use, the coming of the kingdom, but I didn't have a clue as a child what it might mean. So what did Jesus mean when he said, pray, our royal father, may your kingdom come? Well, listen, he tells us right away, your kingdom come, your will be done. Oh, I got it. That much I can get. If God is going to be the king, then his kingdom is in the place where people obey him who do what he wants done. That makes sense to me. But Jesus, where do you want that to happen? Where do you want to see the Father's kingdom come? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice something here, that Jesus does not make the destiny of God's kingdom and of his will heaven. Heaven is the standard for the destiny of the kingdom. And what's the destiny of the kingdom? The earth! Now, if you and I had written that verse, if we had created this prayer, we probably would have done it a little bit differently. We may have said something like, Your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven because that's where we're going to spend eternity after all and we really need it to be nice up there. But that's not why Jesus came to this earth. That's not why he taught us this prayer. It's not why he is in your life today. That you may go to the place where everything is as it's supposed to be. Jesus came here to see something else happen. It's already like it's supposed to be up there. He says, what I want is the way it is up there to be true down here also. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth like it's already being done in heaven. The earth, living here, is the place where the kingdom of God is to come. And that's almost the opposite of what we tend to think. Because if you are a normal Christian person, then the way you think about life is this, usually, is, you know, Jesus really wants me to think about religious things and think about things that are spiritual and all that's there somewhere. So I'm going to think about those things and I'm going to try not to pay attention much to what's going on down here. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just kind of live my life and not get too engaged in it. And what I'll do is just sort of make it through in whatever way I had the opportunity to make it through, and then I'll be doing all that in the hopes that I'll spend eternity up there in the clouds somewhere. In fact, it's not just you who follow Christ who think that way. Uh, That's the way many people who don't even claim to be religious think. I mean, think about it this way. Suppose you were to ask an unbeliever. Now, I mean someone who really doesn't believe in Jesus and knows they don't believe in Jesus. And you were to ask them this question, what would be a good life? The kind of life you'll be glad to have lived, so that at the last moment, as you're taking your last breath, you can say, I'm glad I lived this life rather than somebody else's. What would they say to you? Well, most, by looking around here, most of you look like you'd have friends, unbelieving friends, who would say things like these. Well, I hope not to get divorced more than once because that really hurts. And if I'm going to have a good life, my kids need to do well. I couldn't call it a good life if my kids weren't doing well, so I need that to happen too. And everybody needs money, and so I need a good job, and maybe if I make a lot of money, I could retire early so that I can enjoy life before I get too old to enjoy life. That would be nice. And, you know, I know everyone's going to get sick, but I want to have as little sickness as possible. I know everyone's going to die, but uh, the best way to die is in the middle of the night because you don't even know it's going to happen. And then the unbeliever will say to us, if after I'm dead, I wake up and I discover there is a God and there is a heaven, I hope he will agree with me that I was good enough to get in. Isn't that where most of the unbelievers you know are? If that's where you are today, hoping that if there is a God and there is a heaven, he might agree with you that you are good enough to get in. If that's where you are today, let me tell you something. 
I have some bad news for you. Nobody has been that good except Jesus. That's why to make it into the pleasure of God, to make it into eternal life, we have to do it with Him by putting our trust and our faith in Him. And it makes me sad to hear people living their whole lives, some of them, uncertain of what's going to happen to them after they die, hoping at best that there may be a God and that maybe He will agree that they're good enough to get in. What a sad life to live. Let me tell you some good news. You don't have to live that way. Come to Jesus, and you will know that you have eternal life. But suppose we were to ask a Christian the very same question. Now, I mean a real Christian, mind you, you know, somebody like you, who comes to church and reads the Bible, knows where the numbers are in the hymn book here, and, you know, you know the tunes, even though they don't have the music there, you know the tunes already. I mean, that's how Christian you are, right? You're really in this thing called Christianity. What would we say if someone walked up to us and said, what would be a good life? I mean the kind of life you will be glad to have lived so that at the last moment, as you're taking your last breath, you can say, I'm glad I lived this life rather than some other, this one. I'm glad. What would we say? Well, nowadays, a lot of us would have to say, I hope not to go through more than one divorce because it it really hurts. A lot of true followers of Jesus would say, you know, I couldn't call it a good life if my kids weren't doing well, so I need my kids to do well, and, you know, everybody needs some money. If I could just have a good job, I could make enough money, then I could retire early and enjoy life before I come too old to enjoy life. That would be good. I know everyone's going to get sick and die, but, you know, I want to die with just as little pain as possible, and even followers of Jesus will say, the best way to die is in the middle of the night when you're asleep because you don't even know what's going to happen. I can't think of a worse way to die. I want a two-minute warning. I've got some things to say. And now that everybody has mobile phones, they're going to record it and we'll tweet it out to the whole world, huh? (laughs) The last two minutes of my life, I pray every day, Lord, give me two minutes to say what I've got to say. But that's where the story changes a bit, doesn't it? Because we believe that once a person passes away, their souls begin to shake like this and sparkle with the little lights, perhaps, sprout wings on them and... Fly away to heaven. And when we get to heaven, St. Peter's up there, and he looks at us, and he says, come on in. You have the blood of Jesus on you. Come in to heaven. And he said, but wait just one minute. And he runs over to a closet, and he pulls out of that closet a great big golden harp. And he hands it to you, and he says, that's your place. Now go over there and start singing and start playing that harp forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Have you ever been in a choir? (laughs) Sounds more like the other side rather than heaven, doesn't it? Now, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, I can do that. But forever is a lot longer than 10,000 years. I have some really good news for you, follower of Jesus. Jesus did not come to this earth so you would have a golden harp to play forever as if somehow you would overdose on celestial Prozac so that you could believe this was bliss. No. Jesus died on the cross not so you would have a golden harp to float around in the clouds. Jesus resurrected from the dead not so that you could spend eternity up there. Jesus is now reigning over all things, not so he can swoop you up and take you out of this world, and he's not coming back. He's not coming back to get you out of here. Jesus died, he resurrected, he ascended into heaven, and he's returning so that he can make all things new. So that he can make what the Bible calls the new heavens, yes, but also the new earth. And it will all belong to him, this new wondrous earth. And when he comes back again, He will look at you who have followed him and he will say this, it belongs to me, but now it also belongs to you. That is our dream. That is our hope. That is our destiny. And nothing less than that should compel your heart every day of your life. That one day you will inherit the earth in Jesus. 
how wondrous that will be. In fact, we get glimpses of it even now. In this horrific, war-torn, sickness-plagued world that we live in today, even in this world, we get glimpses, don't we? When that first child is born, the beauty and the wonder of that moment, when you first fall in love, what a delight. When you see that sunset that takes your breath away, when you hear the concert that brings such unspeakable joy to you that you simply stand in awe of it, the painting, the person, the worship service, You name it. You've had those experiences of ecstasy, even in this, even in this fallen world. Now imagine what it will be like. Imagine for just a moment what it will be like to live as the image of God, free of sin, in a world that is free of sin. No more pain. No more suffering. No more doubts. No more fears. No more regrets. No more shame. But a world that is filled with the brilliant glory of God and you living, honoring God, and enjoying Him in that world forever. That is why Jesus came to this earth. And that is what He offers to every man, woman, and child who will come to Him. Do you want that? But do you see what that says to us? It says to us that as we go into the ordinary times of life, when we're not dealing with the highs and the lows, but when we're reorienting ourselves, what's our reorientation to be toward? Serving the will of God on this earth. Moving the kingdom of God forward day by day. Not living for ourselves, but living for him. You know, Jesus told his disciples that they were to go to all the nations. They were to bring his teaching to everyone. They were to baptize them. They were to save them. They were to deliver them from death. (sighs) But before he said that to them, he said this. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, to Jesus. All authority has been given to me. Now, if you and I had been Jesus at that moment, we would have looked at our disciples and we would have said, okay, I'm all that. I'm really that important. All authority has been given to me. So you sit back and watch the show. It's going to be unbelievable what I do. But it's not what he did, is it? He looked at people like you, people like me, just ordinary people. And he looked at them and he said, I'm going to give you the greatest privilege that a human being could ever have. I'm going to let you share with me in turning the world into the kingdom of God. Now that is a vision for life that can compel you through the hard times and can move you forward through the good times and through the ordinary times. It's so big, it's so powerful, so compelling that it's something you can hand to your children for them to live out of as well. And not just they, but your grandchildren and your children and the generations to come. Isn't that what you want? I think it's true. You don't want the monitor over your hospital bed like this. No, you want it to have the ups and downs, and life has that. And when those ups and downs come, it's crisis or it's celebration, so we're all consumed with the good or with the bad. But when you hit the button again and you reset to the ordinary, when God in his providence puts even a church like this at a time where it says, okay, no more crisis, what are we going to be? We have to find what's important. What's at the top of the list? And you have heard what Jesus said should be at the top of your list. Our royal father, enthroned in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray together. 
Our Lord Jesus, we bless you and we honor you for these precious words that you have given to us. Now, Holy Spirit, we say to you, as much as we may want, we cannot do. So come upon us now, fill us, and empower us with the power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, that we may walk in the newness of life, serving our great heavenly King, serving his kingdom on earth. Amen. Well, let's sing together as we close. Hymn number 732. Lord, be my vision supreme in my heart. Bid every rival give way and depart. You, my best thought in the day or the night, waking or sleeping, your presence, my light. Number 732. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.